Hey, what's up guys? Today we're going to be talking about AP Environmental Science Unit 1. So the first concept we're going to talk about today is ecosystems. The College Board defines an ecosystem as a community of living organisms in conjunction with the non-living components of their environment, interacting as a system. So some examples of some living organisms include birds, plants, mammals, etc. Some examples of non-living components include soil pH, weather, and temperature. Uh, something the College Board really wants to emphasize is the interaction within an ecosystem. So make sure you understand that. Okay, so let's actually talk about some interactions within an ecosystem. Um, first interaction we have is a predator-prey uh, interaction that's pretty self-explanatory. A great example of a predator-prey interaction is uh, the interaction between a fox and a rabbit. The next interaction we have is competition. So this is when um, two individuals of either the same species or separate species uh, compete for something like uh, a resource like food. And the last one we have is a symbi uh, symbiotic interaction. So a common misconception with symbi symbiotic uh, interactions is that both uh, organisms benefit uh, in the situation, but that's actually untrue. So uh, symbiotic interaction uh, pretty much just means that uh, two individuals are interacting uh, closely for a long period of time. Okay, so let's actually uh, talk a little bit more about symbiotic relationships because there's actually a couple types of them. So real quick, the, um, what, the way I like to think about it is uh, plus plus means that both organisms are benefiting from the situation. A plus minus, sorry, plus minus means that one organism is benefiting and one organism is actually being hurt from the situation. And then plus N just means one organism is benefiting while the other one uh, is unaffected. So they're staying neutral. Okay. So let's actually talk about some of these relationships. First, we have mutualism. So mutualism uh, is a circumstance in which both organisms or individuals are benefiting. Commensalism is when one uh, organism is benefiting, the other one is staying unaffected. And parasitism you might be familiar with, so that's when one organism is benefiting and then the other one's actually being hurt. Okay, so a concept that uh, you should know is resource partitioning. That's uh, the division of limited resources to allow separate species to coexist. So what, uh, in certain situations, what species may do is that they, uh, they'll evolve to have a niche that's separate from other species uh, so that their niches don't overlap. So then they won't have to compete for uh, certain resources. Okay, so the next concept we're going to talk about is terrestrial biomes. So the way I like to think of a biome is it's sort of like a grouping of ecosystems that have similar traits. So some commonalities that group ecosystems into biomes include precipitation, temperature, and latitude. So these are just a few, but there are more that determine which ecosystems get grouped into which biomes. Okay, so here are some examples of examples of some land biomes first we have the tundra it's class uh some examples are canada alaska siberia um or sorry some examples of the bio of these biomes are contained within canada alaska siberia it's classified as having a uh, high latitude um relatively poor soil uh longer winters um sorry uh and short summers so the next one we have is the taiga. The uh, taiga can also be called the boreal forest or pine forest. So the taiga is classified, uh, or it's, con sorry, it's contained within uh, Canada, Alaska, Russia. Those are just some examples. 
Uh, so the taiga, what's so interesting about the taiga is that it has no permafrost. So uh, there's not a layer of ice that permanently covers the ground year round. So that means that trees can grow. Um, while in the tundra, trees couldn't grow. It's more so shrubbery. Uh, and it's also the world's largest land biome. Uh, moving on, we have the temperate deciduous forest. It's, uh, it has four seasons, uh, and it has the most wide range of temperatures. Uh, and it precip precipitates about 75 to 170 centimeters uh, per year. Oh, and it also uh, it has relatively good soil. Uh, next, we have the tropical rainforest. So it uh, precipitates a lot. Uh, it's usually humid year-round. Uh, the uh, soil is actually nutrient-poor and sort of acidic because what, what ends up occurring is uh, all of the organic material that uh, would have um, accumulated on the rainforest floor isn't able to because uh, organisms uh, consume the organic material. So it's recycled straight back into the ecosystem without uh, having the chance to accumulate. And without having the chance to accumulate, um, you, won't, you won't be able to have the enriched soil. Okay, so next we have the savanna. The, so the, the savanna has um, tall wild grasses. Uh, it's commonly referred to as the breadbasket of the world. Um, and it also has small shrubs, and it does not have that much precipitation. Okay, so the final one is the desert. So the desert has the smallest, uh, or has a really small amount of precipitation. Uh, there's not a lot of growth. The soil is poor, um, and it's relatively hot in these areas. So here's a um, here's a map um, in terms of the biomes. Uh, I think it's quite interesting to see that similar biomes occur in similar areas. So here we have uh, some tropical rainforests in uh, Brazil, like so the Amazon rainforest, and right here we have the uh, around the Congo. So there's a rainforest there. So as you can see, uh, they're relatively close in longitude, or sorry, latitude. And we can also see this trend occur up here in the tundra and the taiga. Okay. So I like to the way I like to think of these biomes is in terms of uh, images, because if I'm able to associate these images with the biomes, it's easier to understand um, the traits of each biome. So first we have the tundra. So as I said, uh, relatively flat, uh, a lot of shrubbery, not that, that many trees, uh, relatively cold. The taiga, also relatively cold. Um, there, uh, There's no permafrost, so trees are able to grow. And those um, are uh, some of the animals that you can see in the taiga. The temperate deciduous forest, uh, so this has four seasons. So right here we see fall or autumn. Um, and you can see a lot of organic material starting to accumulate on the floor, which is good for the soil. Then we have the tropical rainforest. You can see how dense, uh, uh, how densely populated it is, how, how many organisms. Um, live in the tropical rainforest and how green it is so uh that's that, that's what accounts for the poor soil uh the slightly acidic soil so the savanna um as you can see uh not too many trees only a couple um but there are taller grasses um and the, the way i like to think of the savanna is um uh sort of like the nat geo documentary of uh you know, uh, the wildcats uh, fighting this savanna. So, in the desert, uh, I think this is the easiest one to remember. Um, it's just uh, flat, a relatively poor soil, extremely hot, not humid, um, small shrubs, if any. Okay, so what some people might not know is that there are land biomes, which we might be familiar with, but there are also aquatic biomes. 
So the aquatic biomes can be divided up into this flow chart. I'm not going to go over it in depth, but if you want to, this is the flow chart you should follow and you should be able to understand this in order to ace the AP test. Um, also marine stratification. I'm also not going to go over this in depth. However, if you want to, here's the diagram. It, it explains it perfectly. If you want to go into that on your own time, feel free. Okay, so the final topics um, that we're going to cover today starts off with the concept that's very important. Uh, you need to understand this in order to understand the rest of the unit. So the concept is that energy flows throughout an ecosystem while nutrients recycle through an ecosystem. So first, we're going to call about uh, we're going to talk about uh, nutrient recycling. So I'm not going to go into these cycles in depth. However, I would study these cycles because they probably will show up on the AP test in some capa capacity. Um, so the first cycle we're going to talk about is the carbon cycle. So an important thing to know about the carbon cycle is that the uh, primary way that carbon cycles through an ecosystem is uh, through photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So what, ha uh, what happens is uh, the carbon... Uh, from photosynthesis turns into O2, or sorry, turns into glucose, uh, which uh, is taken up by the mitochondria, and then it converts it back to CO2. So this is the uh, uh, energy cycle, or sorry, the uh, carbon cycle that you might have learned about in bio. Uh, and of course, there are other ways that carbon cycles throughout the ecosystem, but those are less important. Next, we have the nitrogen cycle. Uh, so the nitrogen cycle, uh, similar to the carbon cycle in the, in the way that it cycles, uh, I'm not going to go into the nitrogen cycle in depth. However, you should same thing with the phosphorus cycle, um, and the water cycle, you should already know, uh, you should know from, uh, previous, uh, schooling, uh, it's per so you might see a hydraulic cycle or sorry, hydrologic cycle um, on the AP test or anything associated with AP, but don't worry because that just means the water cycle. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, how energy flows through an ecosystem, right? So we just talked about the nutrient recycling. Now we're going to talk about the flow of energy throughout the ecosystem. So um, an important thing to understand is the... Well, first let's talk about... Uh, how energy enters an ecosystem so what happens is the energy from the uh the sunlight energy uh is tra uh transformed into the chemical bonds energy in, glu in glucose uh by photosynthesis so the first thing that uh happens to energy is that it's converted to the uh the bond energy within the glucose so the gross primary productivity, also called or shortened uh, GPP, is the total amount of energy that is produced by primary or sorry by producers. Um, and the net net primary productivity is the remaining energy after cellular respiration. So pretty much the total energy is, uh, that uh, the producers uh, produce. Uh, uh through photosynthesis is the gross primary productivity while uh the remaining energy once they perform their own cellular respiration to live is the net primary productivity okay let's talk about uh, let's talk a little bit about trophic levels so uh trophic levels is um here's a diagram of it it's pretty much the levels in uh which energy flows throughout an ecosystem um, as you can see, the small, uh, the higher up on the trophic level, uh, you go, the uh, smaller amount of biomass there is. Um, this is because uh, ecology follows a ten percent rule. So the ten percent rule states that um, the higher up on the trophic levels you go, each time you go high, higher up on the trophic level, um, it accounts for about, or you lose about 90% of the energy um, through heat and other uh, processes. Um, so then the 
following organism high, higher up on the trophic level only gets about 10% um, of that energy. And that's also why you have, uh, you end up having less and less organisms the higher up on these trophic levels you go. So uh, next thing we're going to talk about is the food chain um, and food web, food webs. So the way I like to think about it is the food chain um, is, you know, the simple version you learned about uh, way back in fourth grade or whenever you learned about it. Uh, and a food web is just a, a complicated version of food, a food chain because it's multiple food chains stacked together. So ecologists will more uh, often look at food webs uh, because it encompasses the entire ecosystem and how energy flows throughout the entire ecosystem. So let's look at this di diagram real quick. First, we have the producers at the bottom. They perform photosynthesis and get their energy from the sun. Um, so the producers are then eaten by the primary consumers. The primary consumers are then eaten by the secondary consumers. And then the secondary consumers are eaten by the ter or consumed by the tertiary, tertiary consumers. Okay. And uh, they don't include it in here, but there's also scavengers that will um, eat or will consume uh, either dead or alive animals, but they usually scavenge for their food. A great example of this is the vulture. Um, and there's also detrivores and decomposers. So all when all these animals die, um, they will uh, consume those organisms and... Uh, Another concept relating back to trophic levels uh, are trophic cascades. They're pretty much changes in uh, uh, the food web within the ecosystem that affects various uh, trophic levels um, in either a positive or negative way. So the best example I can give you of a trophic cascade is uh, the reintroduction of wolves into uh, Yellowstone National Park. It's quite interesting because they actually ended up, the reintroduction of wolves actually ended up changing the structure of the rivers. I know that sounds like bogus, like I'm, I'm making stuff up, but it was, it was actually true. If you want to read up on that, go ahead because it's really interesting information. So, um, the final concept I want you to understand is biomagnification. So it seems complicated at first, but um, after I explain it to you, uh, it'll be a little bit easier to understand. So let me move this down a bit. Um, so what ends up occurring is uh, toxins or pesticides, uh, things that are harmful, um, end up uh, harming those at the top of trophic levels the most because what ends up happening is um as it as the chemical or you know the pesticide whatever chemical it is travels up the food web it uh, becomes more concentrated uh the higher up it goes so those at the top um actually suffer the most because they have the highest con the highest concentration of that harmful chemical. All right, and that concludes um, my summary of AP Environmental Science Unit One. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.